people have their bios. Um, we brought them in because, well, you know, they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but because of their role here locally with um, plenty of other coalitions. And, the, and both of them are very well connected with the library and we're all sitting at Rockford University. And um, David has the job that those of us in community technology always dream of, and we kind of hate him for that. <laughs> <laughs> actually has a position for community technology and not many cities have that right. So Dave is in a, a unique position to have seen lots of things and have participated in a lot of coalitions. And so um, they're both of their perspectives and both of them worked quite a bit, Sam like um, led the building digital communities. So also if there are any questions you have about building digital communities, they're the folks to ask. Well, thank so you. thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, I really, uh, this is really exciting for me because, um, you know, we spent, uh, the UW kind of was the, the lead organization in developing the framework for, uh, for building digital communities. And I still have to get used to saying it that way because it was the framework for digitally inclusive communities and then it got changed. So I'm still <laughs> making that mental adjustment. Um, but but we worked. Uh, uh, we did a lot of work on trying to uh, articulate what it is uh, that makes a community digitally inclusive, and we looked uh, around the world at different benchmarks and frameworks and initiatives around this, and kind of pulled it together in a way that we felt was relevant in the U.S. And we had some large uh, uh, input groups, and David was on one of the key inner circle groups, and then we had a, a larger online community that was really looking at and talking about what it is, what are we trying to do, and, and also how do we create a framework that has some utility. And since we were working with the IMLS, one of the big goals of this was to create something where public libraries could um, see themselves as a hub in this activity, as a convener of these activities in their communities, and in doing that, um, helping to elevate the public library in the community and helping, to, uh, and helping libraries create more public value um, in their communities through these activities. So uh, it's really great for me to see this kind of being piloted and for all of you to be involved. And I wish I'd been here earlier to hear everybody's um, projects and what you're doing because it sounds really um, like you're on the right track. So I'm kind of, we had, we had a, a, an outline of our presentation to talk to you about it and I don't want to go over things that you're already way ahead of. And I also want to make sure that, you know, while we're here, that if you have questions or things that you want to talk about, that we address those too. So, so please feel free, you know, I, I didn't want to just, I didn't want to assume what you know and what you want to hear. We, you know, we had an outline of a presentation to talk about, <clears throat> you know, what's the value of, for libraries to lead these efforts. Um, and, uh, and how to prioritize using the framework, how to prioritize your, um, your actions and your strategies, um, <clears throat> how to do community needs assessment, which it sounds like you're kind of embarking on, um, and the different approaches that you can use to do that community needs assessment, which helps with that prioritization. The framework is huge, and we didn't expect any community to do everything there. We expected uh, the communities to look at the framework and identify where their gaps were and then prioritize what's important in that particular community. And in some of them, it may not be adoption. Adoption may have already happened. In a more affluent community, you may have a 95% household adoption rate. Well, then you're not going to want to spend time, a whole lot of time on uh, on working towards different kinds of adoption, overcoming different kinds of adoption barriers. You might want to instead work more on those domain areas and getting uh, you know, involved with digital inclusion for education or digital inclusion um, for employment. So, so the needs assessment is part of that strategy for, um, for prioritizing. And then David um, was, uh, wanted to talk about how to work with the broadband deployment efforts in the community. So I think one of the things that, that we heard that libraries have a, 
a, a little bit harder time doing is working with the, um, the internet service providers and getting them to uh, partner with public libraries and partner with the communities and get on board um, with, with thinking about uh, what they're doing in a, in a more holistic sense in terms of digital inclusiveness. And David has done a lot of work um, with the telecos here in Seattle, um, and, and I've worked with Comcast and CenturyLink here too, and just trying to kind of build that those relationships between public libraries um, and those uh, providers, which they don't always see as relevant, and sometimes see it as competition, right? Um, and then also how to get buy-in from others who should be engaged but aren't quite yet. Um, and, and some of the things that we've been doing here in Seattle. And then, and then finally talking about partnerships and what makes a successful partnership and how to build something that's truly resource sharing, which I think is a problem for a lot of um, people involved in this. You have partnerships, but you're not really exchanging anything, right? It's, it's, uh, they're more passive and, and, and they're not necessarily um, um, sharing resources to accomplish a specific goal, but rather you go to them, they come to you, and it's kind of this, maybe a trade-off or an exchange, or maybe it's just totally passive where you're really not getting anything. Like, for example, the public library promotes the low-income uh, internet packages that are um, uh, available from your internet service providers, but the internet service providers aren't doing anything for you except giving you the handouts and the cards or using your building um, for presentations about it. So how do you uh, uh, manage those relationships so that the library is getting more out of it uh, in, an, in an equal uh, proportion to what you're giving to them? So we wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. And then also working within different kinds of institutional cultures. How many of you are part of a city or county government system? And you're you're independent, right? And Kit, you're independent. No, you no, have, no, no, you no. have your. You, it, no, it's uh, no. Yeah, <laughs> part of the city, right? And you have a commission, right? That's no. appointed. No, no it's just no. right. To city, city council, council is, right? the board. is a library board. Is a library board. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that working within that you're institutional good. culture. <laughs> Uh, working within those institutional cultures within the government and then working with institutional cultures with other nonprofit organizations. So that was kind of what we were thinking would might be useful to cover, but um, anything there doesn't sound relevant to you or if there's anything that you want to else that you want us to um, to have a conversation about, um, you know, just let us know. Is there is anything come to mind before we even get started? I, I eventually want one of you to talk a little bit about kind of nationally, what are our mayors hearing in other settings about the importance of this issue? Does that, is the League of Cities talking about it? Is the Conference of Mayors? That kind of thing. <laughs> The US, Con U.S. Conference of Mayors was just last week, um, so um, yeah. Maybe just a quick note on that. I guess while we're there, um, so there's been um, so the U.S. Conference of Mayors was just last week. There was a uh, so there's that. There's the National League of Cities, which tends to be the councils, other elected officials, and then there's a couple of sort of public bodies that work with government and technology. So um, um, so there's the, um, what's the one that partnered on ICMA. ICMA. Mm -hmm. uh, County Managers Association, City and County Managers Association. Um, there's a couple technology groups, there's Public Technology Inc. that a lot of governments work with. Um, you know, we've seen a little bit of kind of cycles of attention, I think, from them. Um, more from the Conference of Mayors, particularly over the last years. There was just uh, so last week, um, there was a um, uh, technology sort of geared around a kind of a technology innovation roundtable, um, which actually our Mayor McGinn facilitated, and there were mayors from uh, 
DC and Boston and a few other cities on that panel. So what we're, I mean, part of what we're seeing is there's um, a lot of the, around economic development is a lot of the sort of um, focus and, and hype, if you will, how do we build a strong technology sector in our community? And, and so that's, that's the jobs piece, right? Um, so that's the piece where the sort of focus is, the sort of secondary focus to, to um, a pretty good extent is um, a combination of uh, open data and uh, better delivery of government services online. Um, and so there's a large, Obama administration has been very strong on supporting open data initiatives and then also the sort of, as you were talking about apps earlier, the kind of apps contests and apps development and it's really that next generation of putting government services online. So that's a lot of where um, I, see, I see the focus, particularly on the mayor's conference to some extent on the League of Cities. The, um, but that said, I know that the, so they both, so they did talk about both that sort of innovation sector um, and they also talked about digital inclusion efforts. Um, so it was something that was at the round table um, at the mayor's conference last week. Um, so it is, I think, an important kind of part of your strategy to think about, and you know, something I, I work on is, how does our city perceive what digital inclusion is, what broadband adoption and deployment are? So there's also, so around the, the economic development is the deployment of infrastructure and um, so that's getting fiber out, that's getting providers out. It's getting sometimes competitive providers. They're, they're sometimes, and it depends upon your community, and this is probably one of the pieces for you guys in terms of your, what you do with your coalition, is also the cost factor, right? So if it's, is it really available to low income folks? Um, and, and then also, <laughs> I think of that also in terms of nonprofits and small businesses. So there's been some attention to sort of what happens in the small business sector, and that's a place where it kind of connects with some of the economic development. And then, of course, the job training that connects with a lot of the folks that come into our libraries and community centers. Um, so, so as Angela's kind of saying, you know, I have my position as community technology planner, I think one of those things that you'll, you'll find and one of the questions to ask is, okay, who in city government is responsible for digital inclusion? Um, who's, who's responsible for that? Who's doing the planning on that? And usually the answer is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where in part, uh, you know, we can talk more, but where you guys have a great opportunity as, as uh, incredible knowledge experts um, to be able to help facilitate and bring that awareness and discussion. And to some extent, there's people in many city governments that are dealing with it in some way. And I can talk a little bit more about kind of the drivers for local government participation. But that's the sort of what I'm seeing in terms of the um, kind of awareness and activity. Uh, that's on the is that helpful? Is that yes, thank you. Do we need the projector? Can we turn it off for a little bit? Yeah, yeah I actually have a hand out of this. Davidson. I'm just going to, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but just in terms of thinking about types of groups um, that, that we work with in communities, um, types of uh, populations, that come in and are looking for help. Um, um, a woman um, who, who uh, was a disabled woman says she really likes to use the term disabled, which I really like, so I'm promoting that. <laughs> um, and we get a lot of confused folks, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I need or... <laughs> um, and, and then there's obviously, uh, and, you know, it's, it's both in the framework, um, we also think about it when we think about different access, or this question, you know, as, as you're talking about, do we do iPad training? Um, do we help people get discounts on internet connectivity? So, so through some of the, the kind of world of what kind of services we provide around technology and digital inclusion and what's the infrastructure to do this, um, these are some of the things you'll see is kind of that, that thread of, of things that people need and, and what we're building. So I have a handout of this stuff. That we can turn off. 
So, um, so did did any of you catch the the article uh, in the paper the other day that IBM has declared that the digital divide will uh, be permanently and finally bridged in five years? Did you, did you catch that? <laughs> Good news. We could all stop now. Let's go. Let's go up and, uh, and have cocktails because our work is done here. Right? <laughs> IBM says so. Um, uh, but but we know that, that that's just not true, and I think. Um, well, I want to challenge you because you said earlier. Well, what if every, there's 99 percent of people have adopted? So right. what does that mean? Right, right. So yeah, and, and I think that that's so. In in IBM's mind, a digital inclusion has been achieved when every uh, person has uh, the ability to connect to broadband at their homes or businesses. Um, and and then we're done, right? And and I think in a lot of ways, um, the the internet providers, the Verizon, the Comcast, and all of those, that is really what they see. That once we have accomplished the infrastructure, um, we are we're done. And 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 now we are digitally inclusive because everybody can, uh, if they choose, connect to the internet. And and I think we know here. That that's just not true, and in the framework, that infrastructure piece of the access is just one of many, many pieces that go into what is digitally inclusive. Um, and I think it's important that that point um, rises to the top because I think it's a pretty common misperception. And if you look at the kinds of investments that have been made. Um, you look at the BTOP program, and the vast majority of the money that went to BTOP um, was invested in, in the middle mile and, the, and the, the infrastructure investment. And there was, there was a recognition there with the PCC grants and the Sustainable Broadband Adoption grants that there's something else that needs to happen in order for us to achieve um, some, some level of digital inclusiveness. Um, and, I, and I think that was an important step and it has a lot to do with <clears throat> the work that public libraries, it's a recognition in many ways of the work that public libraries have been doing for the past 15 years in offering public access and offering um, technology classes and support for um, digital literacy. Um, that, that the FCC really recognized that there's something else there. Um, and it may not be as balanced um, because it costs a lot more to put in wires in the ground. Um, but certainly just having uh, those investments being made in BTOP I think is a big signal um, uh, that there is a recognition on a policy level that there's more to digital inclusion than, um, than, than, what, than the infrastructure. And, and that's kind of where we are. And I think in the, in the framework, um, there needs to be that, that inventory or that assessment of what the infrastructure is, but it's also looking at those other principles and seeing where we are in the community around that. So just to, just to um, also one, one point about sort of um, information literacy in a different sense. So as you see, like um, if, you, if you see a map of your state and you see where broadband is, um, it's important to recognize how they do that mapping. Um, and so this ends up being true as well for your local community. And so um, oftentimes on the maps, they'll say that we have broadband at, at X and Y level there, which means that there's a, sometimes that means that there's just a pipe coming into that census tract. It doesn't mean that I can actually get it over here. Um, and that's particularly an issue for any rural areas. And sometimes that's an issue for hills and stuff too. So, so for instance here, CenturyLink says, well, if you look at a map, DSL goes everywhere, but I know there's a legislator down in Beacon Hill who can't get that service. Um, I, I know that I can't get a cable broadband connection into a building at the university district because they would have to make that extra connection to get it there. So, so just to kind of be aware as people are talking about is infrastructure everywhere, um, also, as we look at where fiber is, and that, that relates to where economic <coughs> development is happening. Um, and so you can begin to look at where there's, in a sense, kind of um, infrastructure redlining um, as a result of that. And so that's also a piece of, you know, so as, 
um, that ends up impacting as well as the cost of it. You'll see projects that said, okay, we're building out infrastructure, but if your branch library can't afford to get that fiber connection, um, that, it's great that it comes nearby. Um, or you can't afford to get it, to pay for it, the extra cost to pay for it to get across the alley. Um, that ends up being a, an inclusion issue as well. $5,000 from the street to the library. Great. <coughs> yeah. And, and we heard uh, you know, during DTOP that there were projects where they were supposed to connect the community anchor institutions and the wire went right past the building and nobody ever, you know, said, oh, you know, here, let's, <laughs> let's put it, let's put a, uh, uh, you know, that extra box. Right, box there. And, and on the other hand, we heard of libraries that actually served as the nodes and so they were able to, um, to get, to make a, a partnerships with the internet service providers to get their internet for free, so. And we've seen cases where there's been, um, cases like where there's been partnerships. I think Kansas City is one where a library is partnered with a housing complex nearby to um, next door to share connectivity. <coughs> there's provided Wi-Fi that, um, that enables residents to also get access to um, internet and library services. Um, but then we've also seen um, places and legislation and policies um, that restrict that in some cases. Um, so, so, you know, we always start out with this question of, you know, what is digital inclusion and, and why does it matter? And it seems like it's intuitive, but, but there's also kind of the deeper part of that, which, uh, you know, David talked about in terms of economic development, but there's also the social aspects, there's also um, the health of the community, the sharing of health information, all of these different things that now uh, requires people to get online and to use uh, um, technology. And so you know, when we talk about digital inclusion, it's not just the ability to connect to the internet, it's, a, it's the ability to effectively use mm -hmm. digital technology. And that's just as important. And I think when, when we're talking to policymakers, um, given, given what we know that the, the viewpoint of um, you know, once everybody gets a wire, then we're done. It's important that when we're having these conversations that we talk about both pieces of it, the ability to access and the ability to effectively use the technology. Because I think <clears throat> libraries can have a role in, in the infrastructure piece of it, but where we're really strong as, as a public institution is in that effective use both from a digital literacy standpoint and from an information literacy. So the first digital divide <coughs> is, that, is that infrastructure piece, but all these other digital divides <coughs> exist uh, beyond that. And I think uh, libraries have a role in all of them, but are especially um, poised to participate in bridging these other divides um, that come up once people have that connection. And that includes affordability. Um, that includes digital literacy. <clears throat> it also includes just the adoption process in terms of identifying relevance. So, so why does it matter? Well, the economic health of the community, but there's also, you know, in terms of attracting jobs, in terms of creating an educated workforce that attracts new businesses to the community, um, in terms of uh, helping children in school achieve education or adults in school be able to pursue higher education. Um, it also matters from an economic standpoint. So we know from the research that people that uh, don't have access uh, uh, to technology and the internet um, pay more for things. And so they have an economic uh, impact. Just you know, similar to the um, food deserts in urban environments, the, the internet desert um, produces economic inequality through, um, through different pricing. People just don't, don't know what things cost, they pay whatever is in the local community. So that has a real effect on people. So if, can you point, to a, point us to a study that I, I, demonstrates that? Yeah, I can send that okay. when I get back. I don't okay. have it anymore. That's all right. It's a bad librarian. <laughs> citing, <laughs> citing things without having them at the tip of my finger. That would be the question we get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and, and, and I think, it, you know, the, the, there's, there was a lot of research early on uh, led by uh, 
Vice President Gore around bridging the digital divide, and, and a lot of uh, research happened about what what goes on with people who are on the wrong side, and what do we do for them? And some of these things came came up, but specific, but but in reality, the the, the digital divide uh, disproportionately affects uh, uh, people of color, people in, in poverty. It just widens those gaps. We hear a lot about income inequality, and that, and this digital divide is an exacerbating feature of what is already um, a divide between classes and between. Um, uh, different socioeconomic statuses. So I think all of those things are important. It's important information to arm yourself with um, as you're going into these conversations and emphasizing in your community why this is important, why should um, our city uh, leaders and stakeholders get involved and take this on as an initiative um, when they have so many other policy areas um, to, uh, to, to pay attention to. And, and two primary, so two primary data points just on the technology adoption side in general are the, so the FCC's been doing um, studies and, and putting that out. For the first time coming up, they're asking, um, starting to ask a few questions in the American uh, Community mm -hmm. Survey too, so the census mm -hmm. is just starting to get that. Um, and then the Pew Center for Internet and American Life is the other mm -hmm. kind of big one in terms of tracking. Um, and then, I mean, we've actually also done here, and I'm happy to share this, um, we've done uh, since 2000 what we call the te Technology Indicators for a Healthy Community Project. Um, so where we've done local measures. And it initially was actually, came from our Citizens Advisory Board, but um, the city had done also, a, and many cities do, a customer satisfaction survey. So one piece was starting to get tech questions into the customer satisfaction survey. Um, but, but we've been using the indicators thing as part of our cable franchise um, ascertainment for, for franchise negotiations. So there's you know, money that goes into that community assessment for that. We've also um, we used some cable franchise money to help pay for this um, survey that we've been doing. And, um, and so we ask questions that helps us get really localized data um, about people's adoption, do they go to the city and government websites, do they, what's their level of comfort with things, what's their concern about security, financial transactions, um, do they look for health information online, uh, comfortable doing that. And then I use that data to go to city departments to help them plan service delivery. So, um, so when the community is doing, our Department of Neighborhoods is doing a neighborhood planning process, um, we've used that data about adoption and differences in adoption and technology use um, to um, help inform them how to do outreach for their neighborhood engagement. Um, we've used it for the city light um, when they're going to roll out new services, for the personnel department when they're going to roll out an online job application service, mm -hmm. to use that combination of what we found from, we actually do a, we do a residential phone survey and then we also do focus groups in multiple languages and I'm happy to share all that info and where that is. Um, Minneapolis I know has adopted some of that and some others. Um, so that we actually use that data as part of delivering services also. But one of the important things is that sort of coming back is some of what that basis is in other discussions is bringing people together to talk about what are the values around called digital inclusion, technology, healthy community, um, positive delivery of services. So that's that served as some of that basis is talking about what those common values and goals are, which is a lot of what the framework provides or what's it called now? Building Building digital Building communities. Digital communities. <laughs> <laughs> Probably better recall that right. Um, provide some framing I think for for some of those discussions. Yeah. But that local survey piece has been helpful for us to sort of verify. Yeah, yeah, and you know we can talk more about that um, needs assessment process because I know that's something that um, that communities kind of struggle with. How do you do that? How do you operationalize a needs assessment? What are the pieces to doing um, doing that? And there's you know, and there's different ways of approaching that, which we're planning on talking about. Um, although it sounds like a lot of you have already kind of leap forward and are engaged in those kinds of activities.
Um, so, so our sense was, you know, the reason why libraries should be involved in this. What is what is it that we're trying to get out of that? And I think um, there's a sense in, in some in coming from some uh, areas that what's the relevance of the library? How does the library contribute to the community? And I think you know when libraries are facing budget cuts uh, and 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 that question comes up. Um, it's a it, it puts a library in a stronger position if they have um, an answer that um, that has a direct relationship to the economic vitality of the community and the digital inclusion is part of it. Libraries are already doing it. Libraries have been doing it for a long time, but um, <clears throat> but stepping that up so that it's more visible um, and that you're getting credit for what you do and that you can present. Uh, what you do in such a way that it has an impact on that. So it's not just that you're giving some digital literacy classes and you provide the numbers and accounts and, and those kinds of things, but you're really getting at impact and, and outcomes of the programs that you offer and contextualizing them within a larger goal of the community. And that's kind of what the framework <coughs> is designed to do. And also to do what David was talking about, which is find a place for coalitions to form around taking action on this and, uh, and, and amplifying the value of what the libraries create in digital inclusion um, uh, by forming partnerships and by, uh, by putting in additional resources in the community. And also trying to position the city librarian really as part of the city's management team. And I know that that's hard, you know, a lot of times in a lot of communities that we found um, there's a, a, you know, the city manager or the mayor, depending on the, on the form of government, has a leadership team that's usually made up of the directors of the fire department and the police department and the water and sewer department and the streets department and yet the city librarian isn't part of that coalition. Um, or that leadership council, and so isn't involved in setting the priorities and the agenda of the city manager and the mayor. Not always the case, and I don't know if that's the case with you, but it's, a, it's an important part of keeping the library visible um, within the city management <coughs> structure as well as externally to your community uh, audiences and stakeholders. And so this framework, we see it as a way of um, like David was talking about, piggybacking on different efforts um, around the city, like adding questions about technology and the library to community surveys that the city is already doing. Um, uh, you know, it took years for the community, uh, the census's uh, survey to add technology questions. It's a long and, you know, kind of uh, difficult process. But once those questions are in there, then you can, you can, then you don't have to spend the money yourself, right? You get down to those key questions, and it's already in something that the city is already doing. So, so, so the 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 benefits of digital inclusion to the to the library, and the benefits of libraries leading digital inclusion, have to do with creating more public value, with raising the status and the relevance of the public library in the community. Um, creating new partnerships, which always strengthens it, the organization, um, and also getting new resources from, from different places than your tax base, but also bringing in resources from other places. So um, there's examples of these kinds of things going on, you know, also what you're doing, but also like in Kansas City, Kansas with the Google Gigabit thing, and they've developed a, uh, the Library of School Coalition that's, that's doing this, doing work around implementing the gigabit uh, uh, line and getting people to subscribe and doing even door-to-door -door, um, types of work, getting people to sign up for it. But, but really, uh, it's about a coalition that formed around um, the idea of digital inclusion and taking advantage of um, this new infrastructure that was coming um, to their communities elevating the, the, the visibility of the public library um, in that community as a key player. And that's really what we're trying to move is 
the library is a key player in economic development and the health of the community. And if we kind of keep that as the goal, you know, the, the out, outcome goal and, and on its way to the impact of digitally inclusive communities, I think it really helps um, frame and prioritize what things to take on and who to go to. Um, uh, to do that. So, so you've decided that digital inclusion is a goal. So how do you prioritize what to do? And um, so the framework provides you a way of identifying the assets and the gaps in the community. So what are, what is a community doing? What is the infrastructure that's available? How much does it cost? How many people um, are connected to it. All of those kinds of things are good to answer and find out and check off and say, okay, where are we in this goal? And where are we in this principle um, in terms of access? Are we, how are we on our infrastructure? How are we on the cost? Uh, how are we on providing uh, uh, computers and hardware to low-income people? Do we have adequate resources? Um, for that. And here in Seattle, we have an organization called Interconnections that um, rebuilds computers and sells them uh, to low income people for $250. They use. 150. 150 now? For low income. For low income. Uh, they use TechSoup to load those computers with uh, software, which I think is really important. So Comcast has a $9.99 <coughs> uh, internet deal in many. Uh, communities and they will uh, sell a, a, a netbook for $150 to those people, but the netbooks don't have any software on them, right? And so you're thinking about digital <coughs> inclusiveness, it's, you know, that's, that doesn't get them there, right? Unless you, because all they will be able to do is browse on the internet, right? And that makes sense for Comcast because they want to create consumers, right? Um, but it doesn't make, it doesn't bring people to digital literacy, it doesn't make the um, it doesn't open up the productivity um, uh, possibilities for a lot of people. So things like that. What do you have available in your community to provide people? And is there a way that you can facilitate that either through the library or a partnership with somebody else? Um, <clears throat> in terms of adoption, what are the barriers to adoption in your community? Where are you in adoption? Is it, is it because of infrastructure and costs? Um, have you gotten to the point where um, where uh, the the big barriers to adoption is that people the people that are left the non adopters don't feel it's relevant? Um, are the non adopters uh, the big barrier for them digital literacy uh, skills so they don't have the skills uh, necessary to use it? Um, you know what what are those barriers with that segment of the population? Whatever size it is, is it 15 percent? Is it 25 percent? And what are, what are the barriers within uh, within those communities, and what can the library do to address them? Um, you know, if it's a relevance, uh, if it's if relevance tips the balance for for a number of people, which FCC's studies um, is starting to show more and more that it's trickling down to this this last group of people, the holdouts, right, who who just don't know why they should or they just don't want to, and and uh, and, and, uh -huh. stubborn. Stubborn. <laughs> stubborn or fearful. And a lot of times one presents as the other. Um, and, and so what do you do about that? And so if it's stubborn or if it's fear of privacy and, uh, uh, and security online, then maybe what needs to happen is more clinics or uh, education in the public about how to be safe online. And that's a role that the library can, can play and form a coalition around. Either in the big in picture, for instance, seniors. So there's been some um, increasing number of seniors who they you know they get handed computers from their kids, right? Um, Paula. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry. Oh, you're you're <laughs> Apple wants a credit card number. Yeah. Yeah. She, that that yeah. 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 So, so that, that fear of doing transactions and right. safety 
I mean, we've done some uh, computer security and safety workshops. We also have a, a basic, a really basics brochure um, that we did. It's, we have in, I think, seven different languages, which I'm happy to share. You guys could, if it was useful, you could take it and put your own branding on it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but yeah, that, that importance of kind of getting over that hump and understand too, and this is, I think this is one of the really nice things about um, some of this coalition building and having a framework to do it around, is that, um, you know, you guys can't, you're not going to be the tech support people, right, for this in here. So part of that, you know, if you really want to solve the problem, it's that combination of the, um, how can I best use it, how do I use it, Safely and understand the financial, you know, the transaction piece. But how do I also get to a point where I get make sure that I've got the right virus software on that that's automatically updating um, that the you know that you're getting the tech support because what happens a lot with seniors is um, you know the, they'll start and they'll click on everything and they'll end up downloading a lots of things. Um, and, and so inevitably they get stuck. And so there's actually been, uh, you know, um, a measurable trend in people that have gotten computers who have been, that have stopped working. And so they've given up adoption because of that. Mm -hmm. And this is another area, you know, that where libraries can intervene because for some people it makes sense for them to continue using public access technology. It doesn't make sense for them to have computers in their homes. They don't know how to maintain them. Uh, equipment breaks. They become non-adopters at that point. So the, this is another opportunity. You know, when you're looking at the framework and, and the, all those adoption pieces. All right, you do a community needs assessment and you find out is there a problem in our community? Maybe it's mostly confined to seniors about. Uh, 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 lack of adoption because of security and privacy concerns, and then what can the library do to help that? Do you know libraries are trusted uh, community assets? So maybe the librarian going and talking about safety to seniors and doing that and working with somebody in the tech field to get that message out creates value in the community and helps with adoption and digital inclusion. And in the industry, there's a I mean, this is a huge growing field of information security professionals. So like we actually worked with our chief information security officer at the city, who I would not want to put in front of a group of <laughs> community <laughs> residents talking about security and safety, um, both because it's really scary and also because of where they go with it. And so, so you guys as interpreters of information so that's, that's sort of one slice of sort of the, the tech applications sector. I mean, in some ways, it's the same, same is true about learning an Excel spreadsheet, right? <laughs> um, or some other applications. Um, so again, that's kind of one partnership opportunity that you might, you might find and, and look at. But it's a process of going, you know, using that and looking at, okay, here's the, here are the adoption principles. Um, and here are the adoption goals, and where are we doing a good job, and where might we need to do more, and how do we find out which things are more important? Well, if, you know, if you're doing a community needs assessment and you're doing a socioeconomic scan of your community, just a paper needs assessment on, on what the status of the community is, and you have a very large uh, senior population. And we know from, from research and other efforts that in seniors, what a big barrier to adoption is privacy and security, then that might give you uh, the indication that that's a direction that the library can go, again, to create this public value and gain recognition in the community as a, a player in the digital inclusion um, realm. So Sam, when you say needs assessment and finding out where the beginning point of the community, how do you, what, what does that look like to mm -hmm. you? Like, is that an actual survey? Is that leaders sitting around a table? How does it happen? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, kind of skipping ahead. So a community needs assessment, there's a lot of ways of going about doing this. Um, we, we often have a sense that, that we know what's going on in the community um, based on who comes into the library and what we know about them or 
um, what we hear about the community. But it's necessary, I think, when you're going into a project like this to have a much more factual and solid understanding of what's going on because that does affect how you prioritize your actions. So, so I would just, just to back up prior to mm -hmm. process, um, that as I think of audience, so where am I, who, who am I assessing, and how do I stray that? So, so we've got kind of residents. Um, the first, obviously, the first subsector we have is our patrons who come into the library, right? Mm -hmm. um, that we have, we have residents, and then there's different demographic groups within that residence, or there's different geography. And then we have um, uh, institutions, right? So another kind of just assessment um, that you could get is from um, just doing, you know, what are the what are the needs and what's already being done by a different organization. This session we had right. this morning. Yeah. So you have that and there's a difference already. between knowing what's happening on a, a individual level yeah. and what's happening, what resources or right. services are being provided by institutions. And put it in the context of the communities involved here. Right. We've got three communities who are in the process of doing that institutional survey that right. feels like that's sort of a necessary first step. Mm -hmm. One community that is preparing more the um, individual learning about the right. mm -hmm. survey. And as we were doing, you know, as I came in as kind of community technology strategic planner, the, I mean, the first thing we did was actually trying to just do a community mapping or directory or assessment of who's already, who else besides, you know, the libraries we know are doing some and what are they providing, but, but who else in the community already is doing some computer technology training. That's the, it was sort of the first piece, which is kind of, um, getting out of the woodwork, the boys and girls clubs, the um, immigrant refugee groups that may have had a computer, the social service agencies. So that's, which is part of kind of our natural also coalition building, coalition mm -hmm. constituency. Um, but building that map of um, what we call community technology centers or now public computing centers or or for them, they think of themselves as just social and community service organizations. Which is a challenge, right? Because right. everybody uses a different yeah. technology. Right. Yeah. And, and understand in going out, people, when you come in and say, you're a community technical center, or you're a public computing center, or um, anything like that, 90% of folks won't have any idea what you're talking right. about. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been a long way challenge. I mean, you don't go out and say, well, are you a photocopier center? Um, <laughs> you know, are we doing a photocopier inclusion project? <laughs> um, so it is coming back to that content, are you using these tools for whatever purposes you're doing, but to try and do that assessment about what kinds of resources are providing. And you should note also NTIA is doing a webinar like today yeah. on this topic. <laughs> so if you have the grants, um, you can get access easily to the webinar recording. And if you're not one of the VTOP grantees, let me know. And I'll yeah, we also have for our um, public computing center directory, um, uh, I'd be happy to send out, we have a list of the fields that we use for that. So, um, so if you want to create a directory. Yeah. yeah. We have a taxonomy that we do, that was developed for, for this specifically and that you know, helps yeah. make it interoperable. Yeah. Is that something helpful for me to send around? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can do that. So the other, just the other slices in terms of type community. So we mentioned, you know, the nonprofit sector is both um, what they're doing, but the challenge you always face is what's what are the nonprofit um, institution needs? What's their technology literacy? Their technology needs as well. And then, and then I think particularly small business sector, which um, to some extent kind of crossing the nonprofit includes like the neighborhood chambers of commerce and things as well. But um, Certainly, the, the small business sector is one in terms of kind of a disadvantaged community, and many of them use libraries, use other community organizations to come in and use their equipment or you know, find your research or whatever it is. Kate, did you have a question? Go ahead. Sort of, I guess it's a comment and then a question. I find that many people who come into the library have their own idea of what the library is for that individual person, mm -hmm. and how you, the problem, I, I, you were saying, Kathy, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that people is people's response to what you offer. So what, how can we sort of broaden that vision of what the library is for each individual mm -hmm. to include things that raise the library helps other people as well? 
Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the most recent Pew study um, said, right, what, it was only 35% of um, patrons knew what the library had to offer in terms of electronic resources, right? So there is, an, there is a kind of, uh, among a lot of people, there's still a perception of the library in terms of traditional legacy services. Um, that are provided and we need to do a better job of getting out there and talking about it. And I think, you know, one of the things uh, that's great about the research is that you can steal it and you can use it to make, um, make noise in your own community about what you're doing. Um, but in terms of the, the community needs assessment, I think the best place to start is with your environmental scan. And it's kind of a systematic thing that involves what, what David was talking about. Who else is doing digital inclusion in the community? Um, one place to start for public libraries in particular is um, what we talked about in Opportunity for All, which are your shadow mandates. So who's referring people to the public library um, for digital inclusion um, purposes? Uh, in Baltimore, when we were working with the Enoch Pratt um, Library, um, we heard that um, the immigrant resettlement agencies were sending their clients to the library to do their immigration paperwork and to set their appointments um, with uh, ICE because now you have to do it online, right? Well, from the library's perspective, what was happening was all of a sudden these groups of women that only smoked, spoke Somali were showing up at the library trying to get help to make their immigration appointments. Um, and, and the library was doing their best to accommodate that, but without that connection to the agency that was uh, sending them that way, it was hard for them to manage that. So uncovering those kind of, that we call shadow mandates because they're, they're a demand on the library that's coming from some non-individual source, right? From some institutional force is pushing people towards the library for fairly specific purposes, and the library just is kind of there as a catch basin, right? And not sure what's going on. And you can manage those types of relationships much more effectively if you bring those relationships into the sunlight. Um, and you can also then take credit for what you're doing and in the process build a relationship with those organizations where they will be your advocates in the future and instead of just this kind of passive relationship. Another one that we found, and what Baltimore ended up doing is actually partnering with some of those immigrant um, organizations to have classes. And so the immigrant organizations supplied instructors um, or translators um, while the library used its technology to hold the classes and gave them space. So then they developed a true partnership. They were meeting each other's needs in a very real sense. And then the immigrant organization became an advocate for the library because um, it was no longer kind of a black hole of how their, their clients get helped, but it was a real connection with the library and the community. So that's kind of one of those things with the environmental scan. You, you can start right in your in your library by asking, you know, where are people coming from? How did you hear about the library and our digital inclusion services? And this is kind of an easy, low-hanging fruit to be able to, um, to start opening up that process. Um, the other thing is looking at uh, other organizations that are in fact providing some of these. And, and as David mentioned, some of them are explicitly community technology centers of one sort or another, where that's their primary purpose, is providing um, technology resources to a certain population. And what we find is usually those community technology centers are focused on a specific population. So the library is serving a very broad audience, uh, and many of these community technology centers are serving very specific audiences, seniors, people that live in particular housing complexes, immigrants from a certain uh, other country, East African or Chinese or Vietnamese um, youth, uh, you know, so they're they are kind of picking off really specific types of populations and it's good to find out who is out there doing it. At the si same time, there's organizations who have incidentally started um, digital inclusion efforts because it's a need, uh, it's, a, it's something they need to do in order to serve their clients for this other purpose. So, uh, like the immigrant, 
uh, resettlement organizations, uh, you know, some of them set up little computer labs for themselves and maybe had a volunteer instructor there because they needed their people to have some digital uh, inclusion in order to do the resettlement, right? And so then they become this kind of digital inclusion provider, but it's not their primary mission. Um, One thing about sort of selling that to your library too, I mean a couple of the, the couple of the motivators, I guess, uh, if you will, that, um, that we've seen kind of reasons why the why, it's, why it helps the library to to go out and be talking and get out and partner with some of these groups. So it, it brings some of the expertise about other communities, about the immigrant refugee community, into the to the library. Um, I know um, the city in general, we've had folks from some of those communities come and do cultural competency training for like for staff. Um, so that's that's one opportunity. Uh, it's also part of just marketing the library. So, so all these sites out in the community are potential places that, as you kind of coming back to your question, are potential folks to help market what some of those services are. Um, it, it can also bring some uh, cultural competency or focus or additional tools to library resources. Um, so, for instance, a Vietnamese group has done a bilingual Vietnamese English um, how to teach computer manual. Um, so that's something that, you know, great resource to the library. Another group that um, we helped support did a um, how to find jobs online. Um, so included interface from city government, you know, how to find that if you're at the library. Um, so there's that, that opportunity for sort of content partnerships and training partnerships. And, and I have to say from the other end, one of the things that's been, I think, really useful for um, staff at some of these community organizations that they just didn't have access to is to get um, some training from library staff in how to best find and use materials as well. Um, so we've had the Seattle Public Library staff here has done training for some of these community organizations. So again, that's also brought people into the library for some of that as well. So that's that's kind of the, the one level of the of the community scan is just starting inside, right? And what's going on with the library, who your users are, uh, what other organizations are using the library either implicitly or explicitly, and then looking to the next circle of digital inclusion, who else in your community is providing these types of services, um, in, including the schools and, and others, um, don't, not forgetting the charter schools. Um, I think uh, uh, we discovered uh, in, actually it was in Oakland, uh, uh, there was, we interviewed the principal from a charter school who just couldn't say enough good things about the library. And, um, and, and, you know, when we were having this conversation, what finally came about was he was able to not pay for a library in the charter school because he basically used the, public, the Oakland Public Library as his own library. And what he was doing was he was taking the whole school, it was a small school, you know, 40 students, but he was taking the whole school over to the library. And all of a sudden, the library was going, where are all these kids coming from at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? And, and you know, they were using the computers, and they were needing help. And so this is, again, one of those shadow mandates that once you uncover, well, the, the, the guy is already his library supporter. He wasn't going to your city council. He wasn't going to Oakland City Council hearings and saying, how great the library is and how the library supports the charter school. It was just something that was happy. So it's so it's really important to find out who these people are and reach out to them. I mean, that's really why you're doing this environmental scan and the needs assessment is so that you have a list, basically, of people who are using the library or who might use the library who you can reach out to and or think about forming partnerships with. You also want to do an environmental scan of your socioeconomic factors I think 
really doing that kind of formally, finding out about your community, what are the poverty levels in different uh, segments in different neighborhoods, particularly if you're a, a multiple outlet library system, how is the community surrounding those outlets doing? What are the adoption, uh, if you have that information? But all of these public, the public information you should be reviewing, kind of compiling so that you have a really good understanding of what's going on in the community outside the library. And can you partner with other organizations who have already done that, yes. like the school district? Yes, yes, absolutely. So don't start from scratch. You don't need to start from scratch. Most of that information, one way or another, is publicly available. Chances are somebody's already done an analysis of it. You know, and schools are great for that because they have usually people on staff who are paid to do that because they already have these reporting requirements that libraries don't necessarily have. So it's a good place to school start. Lunches and things like that. School lunches. Right. So right. We get school lunches. Uh, I know that we get some data on. Um, uh, the number of kids who uh, are in English assistance mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. um, by school. Um, so that's one useful piece of data. Um, They've also quoted for me which, which schools and how adjacent they are to our libraries um, have parents who are not as involved for whatever reason, mm -hmm. economics, language, etc. Right. right. Yeah. Many, uh, some, most cities will have, or counties will have some demographer, so somebody that does, is familiar with the census data, um, so that may be in a planning department, that might be in the human services department. The yeah. human services department, huh? GIS. GIS, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. you know, talk to the GIS folks, they'll, they'll at least know who that is. Your universities um, probably have a department that's, that's working locally um, yeah. around that. So yeah, the information is out there and that's why we kind of start with that environmental scan and gather the information so that you're not doing surveys that have already been done. So that you're not uh, doing desk research that somebody else has already done analysis on. The other profile uh, is, you know, talk to the, the, the human services department folks. Because they also collect a lot of data and contract with a lot of organizations for services. Mm -hmm. So sort of look at what, um, what um, initiatives they may have. Are you saying human services of municipalities? Of municipalities, yeah. And not well, so much human resources, and... but for example, in our community, it's neighborhood resources. Mm -hmm. right. It may be called something right. different, but whoever mm -hmm. works with what used to be called the CDBG grants. Right, like, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And then you can also look at counties for the, you know, the welfare department or the unemployment mm -hmm. department and all of those. They will all have m much of this information that will help you kind of see where the library sits within the community and who your uh, who your who your stakeholders really are. I think one of the the things that I see a lot in libraries is that we tend to um, uh, weight too heavily what we hear from people that come in through our doors. Mm -hmm. And that you know, it's really important to hear from a broader community, including your non patrons, um, to know how to prioritize um, what you're doing. So, so that, in, that process of environmental scanning and that process of identifying the pockets of need um, in your community is, is a really important first step to be able to talk about it, to be able to prioritize, and, and to be able to move forward. We uh, used our chamber for mm -hmm. this, yeah. that information because they have things besides business information. Mm -hmm. so right. We've helped them. Yeah. Yeah. And but our economic development. So. Economic development agencies, uh, yeah, all of those all of those places have that and if you know, and the census also has really great information. Um, things like, you know, what percentage of your households uh, are speaking languages other than English it gives you some idea of uh, immigrant population, uh, you know, number of the households and the ages of the children and the sizes of those households, um, you know, that, that's another important piece of information. All of these things to kind of get a handle on um, what's going on in the community. You know, kind of a different take in a way. Um, and one of the drivers for us on doing some digital inclusion and community training has been around violence prevention. And um, you know, we specifically got some funding actually th through one of the city council members 
who wanted to support violence prevention, and he saw the connection between digital media training and violence prevention. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, uh, that sort of continues to grow in a way, um, in that you know, we look at crime, we look at hot spots, we look at where the city is doing initiatives to target prevention, which is both youth activities and family activities. Um, and, and family literacy, you know, so, so can, a, can a parent help their kid with homework? Can a parent get the, you know, find the childcare online or the job online that's gonna help them? So um, that, it's been a really interesting connection. So for instance, there's a project right now um, to look at hot spots of crime and do family support around those hot spots of crime. And so the, um, in part, the library in that area, as well as a number of community organizations in the city are involved in a coalition. So, so in a sense, that's kind of our digital inclusion table going to the, being at their table, you know? But it obviously relates to what happens um, in our libraries and in front of our libraries and so on. So kind and, of a different piece of the combination of data and coalition. Yeah, and, and that's really kind of the second piece of the environmental scanning is looking at uh, what are the community prior priorities going on in the community. So looking at your city strategic plan, looking at other sources of indicators of public priorities. So in some communities it's going to be violence prevention, in some it's going to be college completion, and there's usually some sort of public declarations of one sort or another that indicates these as community priorities, initiatives that are going on in the, in the community. When you're looking at those and you think about how does how could digital inclusion contribute to achieving those community priorities, that's what you're trying to do, but you want to really find out, you know, what is the mayor talking about at the state of the city address? What are the priorities that he's outlining or she's outlining uh, as as the agenda going forward for that year, and how does library and digital inclusion um, fit or or potentially contribute to this? So it's really uh, it's a it's part of the environmental scanning is finding those finding that out, gathering those those kinds of strategic plans and documents and other indicators of um, what the community sees as its priority. So in Seattle. Uh, uh, transportation, in particular, access for bicycles. It's very clearly a community priority. It's not going to be a community priority in other communities. But that's a community priority. So how does a, how can the library contribute to uh, that community priority of bicycling uh, and alternate, say, alternate transportation modes? Um, you know, w where can the library fit into that? How can they join that bicycle coalition? Well, you know, maybe it's uh, you know providing some sort of workshops on bicycle repair or something. I mean, it's not digital inclusion necessarily, but well, that's what's right. 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 then what's the digital right. inclusion what's, like there? Right. You know, is it is it you know mapping or you know you know how how can that? And it's not always going to be there. It's not always going to be something. But it's good to be aware of what those other priorities because they're competing with your priorities, and you should know your competition. Right. You know, I, I like I like that idea of. Uh, we talk about embedding the librarian, about uh, embedding digital inclusion, digital training in everything we offer. Mm -hmm. I mean, libraries and ours is included. You know, we open up our doors and mostly women come in and they sit around and knit together, which is mm -hmm. fun and cool. And, but we're not really doing anything to with that. Mm -hmm. And here we have a captive audience. I think, well, what could they be? showing them. Mm -hmm. And some of them will not need this, but some will. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah, they may not think they want it now, but down the road, yeah. they're uh -huh. going to think about your needing to show them some websites with all these patterns right. on it. You right, know, and there, there's right. your relevance. Yeah. So right. your barrier is the relevance. Oh, exactly. There you go. We have that. It's also making sure they understand. I think it's not just information coming in, but they can be information providers. Yeah, right. Right. You have That's a fabulous right. stitch. You have some fabulous patterns. Yeah. In uh, in yeah. Philadelphia, uh, the Philadelphia Free Library, you know, they have the um, library hotspots. Have you heard about that program? It's this fabulous program where they've gone out and and uh, Chauvin and their and their crew there 
did a really great job on the community needs assessment. They used GIS and census data to identify areas that were underserved by the library and by digital inclusion, and then they partnered with community centers in those locations, close to those uh, deserts, uh, to set up uh, mobile hotspots where they come out with laptops and use a community center as a mobile hotspot. They also did some really great programs um, around digital literacy in addition to just providing the equipment and the connection. They, I know with one, uh, with a Cambodian uh, uh, community organization, it was a bridging the, the generation divide. So if it was Cam Cambodian, their, their priority was connecting the, the you know, first or second generation kids with the grandparents, that there was this growing uh, divide between the generations that was really important to them to maintain. And so um, they developed this digital literacy program where it was around cooking and sharing recipes and, and, uh, and, and working together. And so they were introducing digital literacy to the older uh, members of their community, but also drawing this connection with generations and strengthening those bonds within the community. So it's a great program that addressed that. But, but, but you can see they, they really concentrated, they really spent a lot of time figuring out where to place those hot spots in a very systematic mm -hmm. kind of way. Um, that they use that environmental scanning data that you collect in order to do that and have have an effective program. Saying it was about the need, but it was also about which organizations already had the connections, right? right? So mm -hmm. you're not starting from scratch if a particular immigrant organization already has connections with the community. It's right, right, exactly. Yeah. And part of the big <laughs> picture, and this is something we've worked a lot, a lot on, is so how do you strengthen those smaller organizations as well? So they may have real talent in knowing their communities, but they have limited funding or you know, they need assistance and curriculum. Maybe it's a strong suit. Right. right. And so I mean part of our work around some of those is connecting with other nonprofit assistance things, but it's also finding opportunities. So as a for instance, one of the capacity building things that we did at one point is um, working with the library, we wrote a grant to Department of Education. Um, to to help build out training and help build out equipment, and then, and then more recently, um, got one of the federal BTOP grants to do help 35 sites in seven different counties build out capacity, share curriculum, um, and so on. So, so kind of part of that's understanding what their needs are, and as you work in college, and we're seeing what their limitations are. We know that there's you know if there's one staff or three staff, it's going to be harder for them to cover the facility, you know, to get to meetings and, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to put things in. So I, I'm just going to hand around, this is our uh, online newsletter called Brainstorm. As you're just talking, there's a little article here we just did about uh, Jack Straw Audio Productions doing English training and having families do um, stories together. But um, this is something, too, if you guys are interested in subscribing to it, that we do a, a monthly newsletter. Um, that talks about activities going on in the community, obviously promote city stuff, also links and other resources, and so we promote some library things. But it's also part of the opportunity for building that digital inclusion coalition, I think, is also the cross-marketing. So kind of working with those folks to say, how can you help get their word out, and how can they help get your word out? So, so this kind of regular newsletter is one of the ways that, that we actually do that in part, too. And one of the, the benchmarks in Edge is about you know, do you have do you know who the other digital inclusion providers or digital literacy providers are in your community and can you refer your clients or your patrons to them uh, if you're not able to meet their immediate needs and um, and this kind of goes back to you know our usual as librarians our usual. Kind of thing we don't want anybody to leave empty-handed right we don't want a book in every hand before they leave and we don't want to turn people away when they have digital inclusion needs completely either so if it's something you can't meet is there someone else in the community and that helps you um, as well it's also understanding your needs that sometimes in your capacity so uh, i think so one of the things that happened, for instance, in a neighborhood called South Park here, and not the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> this one had the name South Park before the cartoon. Um, is that um, 
a provider coalition there has done some coordination of um, class times and workshop times and public access hours times. Um, so, you know, so that's that's helped kind of ameliorate some of the after school hours and figuring out that coordination for, for them as well. So sometimes that may be best done on a real localized level by the branches, um, but but um, in sort of role in helping facilitate and encourage and look at that. And that public computing center directory, knowing who else is doing the training out there, and even if they don't offer that training right now. So for instance, a you know, a, a lab in a public housing complex or something may be able to offer training, um, you know, through partnering or, again, that sort of coordinating hours, coordinating what kinds of things are offered. Um, is sometimes uh, there's opportunities there, I think, particularly on kind of the, either the branch level or the local neighborhood level. So, Sam, the, the EDGE session during midwinter is Saturday, the 14th? Yes. So for those folks who are interested, yes, we will be we will be uh, rolling out version one, uh, so you'll be able to see the full. Although we also has already got a got a preview, <laughs> um, but yeah, it will be rolled out at, at the um, at the conference on Saturday, um, ten thirty. Um, if you want information, I have yeah. it to go. So we have just about twenty minutes left. So if there are topics you want to make sure you hit, and then we can make sure you guys have time to ask yeah. your questions. So I just wanted to touch really briefly on kind of the two other pieces of doing the needs assessment and the community um, um, uh, finding out what how to prioritize, and that is the community forums and focus groups uh, conducting those kinds of things. And this is really about hearing from. Uh, individual members of the community um, directly and finding out what their needs are and what their perceptions are of digital inclusion and it, you know there's a lot of different ways to go about doing that but I think it's a very helpful exercise even if you're only doing it with you know a limited number of people hearing from them kind of helps contextualize before you go out and commit to a survey what do you really need to know um, from people and, and getting that kind of um, sense. You can do community forums and focus groups after surveys or before surveys. My personal preference is before so that it helps inform survey questions. But it also can validate and give more life to what you hear. Um, but, but these should be public and you can invite them, you can invite clients through your partners at these other nonprofit organizations. But the idea is really to hear from individuals about their perceptions and thoughts and needs and getting some uh, different perspectives than just from the leaderships, uh, the leadership uh, circle of, um, of the community. Um, then, you know, kind of the, the last piece of that can be surveys. And um, uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Harry Hattrey, who's um, at the Urban Institute and does a lot of uh, work on evaluation is, um, it's better to be roughly right than precisely ignorant. <laughs> and I use that to talk about surveys because there's a, oftentimes there's a perception that in order for a survey to be valuable, it has to be representative. Now I'm a researcher, so I love representative things and I love representative validity. Um, but it's not, it's not the most important thing. It's nice to have, it's a nice to have, but not a must have. You still get information from surveys. You treat it like information you get from focus groups. It may not be representative, but if you're hearing from 2,000 people, you're hearing from 2,000 actual living, breathing human beings with opinions and needs and that, and you can use that information, and you shouldn't feel ashamed or, or even hesitant to do that. If you have the resources to do a, a, a representative survey, that's great. Um, you want to make sure that the survey itself is actually asking the questions that you need to know. And sometimes that can be very hard, especially if you're working with a coalition to develop a survey. Everybody wants to know something, uh, something different. But they can be very uh, uh, useful, um, but you really need to have a purpose in mind. What is it that you need to know? And that's why it's important to do that environmental scanning first, because you might find out that, that information already exists. 
use your survey and the money that it costs to get information you don't already have. Um, and if it's possible, piggyback on somebody else's survey. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a city survey. If you can add one or two, you know, go to the university who, who does the surveying, who does surveying and find out what's going on. Go to marketing, you know, and see. Can you add one or two or three questions to their survey? Saves a lot of money and, uh, and gives you that kind of representative data. So it's a way of, of doing that. And on an ongoing Public basis. Public health, uh, health educators and health communities yeah. are the one that does community surveying is excellent at it. So yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. So, you know, oftentimes once you're down and you've already done all this other work, you only really need to have five questions, let's say. You know, what percentage of people are using public access technology, not just in libraries, but in other locations? What percentage of people are adopters if that hasn't already been asked by somebody else? Um, you know, uh, what are their needs, how do they use um, the technology, those might be the kinds of questions. But you don't have to do a $50,000 survey necessarily to find those things out. And especially if you only have a few questions left, um, it's often more efficient to add them onto somebody else's um, survey. So that's an option for kind of lowering your investment in, um, in, in doing surveys. Web surveys are another perfectly good way of gathering information from a lot of different people. We used an opportunity for all, you know, we did a phone survey and we talked to 2,500 people and we did a web survey and we talked to 50,000 people. And, but um, you need to be cautious and aware right. of the difference in data and the right. demographic mm -hmm. validity of right. the differences. But, but in these days with people, you know, part of the problem is, is the people who answer telephone surveys are different than people who don't. And some of that is taken care of with cell phone samples, which are getting more um, popular. Cell phone samples aren't really representative, though. I mean, we do statistical stuff, magic to them, to force them to be representative. But because we don't know uh, how many cell phones there are, and how many cell phones there are in that particular area that you're surveying. We don't have the denominator to actually do the proper uh, um, statistical analysis without getting too technical about it to, to, to get that. So, uh, I'm trying to move this along, yeah. sorry, because we kind of get in a hole on this. Yeah. So, so yeah. anyway, but web survey, <laughs> web survey is another way of doing, of doing this environmental scanning and hearing. So so just, just, a, just to kind of I think it's an important thing. I don't know where you all are in that, but gathering that information is how you begin to set those priorities. Kip, did you have a question? Um, I can hold it. Okay. Okay, then. Okay. <laughs> and you, you want to? Yeah, I think I'll just make one comment and then just want to make sure we have time to just sort of open up further questions too. Um, I would just say, you know, one of the things, so um, working, uh, working with providers and being able to tell the story of what you're doing and thinking about their interests. You know, so we know that from a provider perspective, they're interested. Can you define providers, please? Uh, so I'm talking right now about internet service providers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, good point. Um, and so, um, and, uh, under, actually, one th so one piece is internet service providers. There's another whole whole other potential world of partnership, which are the software providers. So as you talk about looking at community, who's the tech sector in your community? I mean, there's a whole business community of people that are maybe delivering services online, maybe developing apps. Um, so I know in our case, there's a software industry association. Um, and, and those folks have a lot of interest in getting services out and also future employees. Um, so working with the internet providers, they're interested in getting market share and they want to see people use broadband. So we've done some partnerships to say, um, you know, these are centers that demonstrate the ability to use broadband uh, and showing how to use that effectively. Um, and so I think that's one place in terms of approaching them. Um, we found in general, it's probably the marketing people, sometimes government affairs people. I mean, I think in any organization, it's finding, kind of doing enough snooping around and presenting what you're doing 
to find out who's going to latch on to what you're doing, you know, who's going to be interested in that coalition. Um, but certainly some of that then is, and so that's been a really important part for us. And we've probably found, you know, I think probably the government affairs and the marketing people are the two that have kind of latched on them the most, although sometimes that's maybe different. Um, uh, you know, and some we've done some joint things where they've been able to come out and talk about their products, uh, you know, discounts for low income folks. Um, we've actually done, CenturyLink here has done sort of an interesting thing. They've got their low income broadband program, which is partly mandated by FCC. Um, but um, uh, we've connected them with a couple organizations. So they did some workshops on to talk about their low income thing, but also talk about um, how to do effective internet searching. Um, you know, a couple other things about how to use the web um, that they did, and then they um, worked with those organizations to translate materials, to do a whole presentation, and one in Chinese, another in Vietnamese. Um, so that helps kind of build the partnership. Um, we have talked to them some about understanding the operating environment for those organizations that they should also try and make an investment as they're doing that. It's part of building those partnerships. We also have some providers. We have a state, we formed a state council on digital inclusion. Um, and so we have a combination of um, library, community organizations, and providers and government all at the table on this council for digital inclusion. Um, so there's been really valuable exchanges um, in that as well. And then just sort of finally, one of the things I, um, I know it's still a challenge for us, I encourage as you're doing this, is to practice elevator speeches. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's something you do here. <laughs> you know, and I, I think that's figuring out and just working with yourselves and working with your staff. We've done some trainings for providers and going to the legislature. But just, you know, practicing getting an elevator speech down and then also that piece of the speech is relating it to whatever person you're going to meet with. Would it be helpful for um, us to do either a webinar or just you know, gather information on the different low like affordability kind of adoption efforts going on out there? That seems like something that we haven't. That was one of my questions because it seems like some states are far ahead of other I mean, states. Like mine. City, city. The last I understood in Arizona, there were they were doing a pilot project with three rural communities, and you say they. I'm not really sure. Okay. I, got a, I got a document from the State Library about it. And so we're really behind the eight ball when I hear about California and Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll figure out how to pull, because there's quite a few fabulous examples out there working with providers, and there's also some where folks have um, totally skirted around their traditional cable providers mm -hmm. and are coming up with other low cost mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll come up with those. And there's those two pieces of it. There's, there's the just getting the connectivity piece that some of the internet service providers and others are working on. Ten dollar a month kind of ten dollar a month kind of thing. There's also in some areas a ten dollar a month for nonprofit organizations to get the connectivity. Um, and then there's the whole piece about how do I use broadband? Right. Why should I use it? What are some of those services that I think actually coming back to that knitting circle is a, yeah. a valuable one there. Yeah. yeah, there are plenty of providers out there who will do the ten dollar a month kind of services, but they that whole digital literacy thing ugh, that part's expensive. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cheaper yeah. for to do the ten dollar a month than to the digital literacy. Right. But how valuable is that? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Or they're doing digital literacy really badly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 They're not doing tech support. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know, uh, I, it's hard to get the the internet providers to actually put cash on the table. Yes. Um, you know, the best place to get that is out of marketing and making the case that, you know, you're, you're contributing to the community and the library will praise you for it. Right. Um, yeah. but, but, but it is really, we, you know, the, when, when we were working with them, uh, and there's different attitudes among different providers. So, you know, here in Seattle, it's mostly, you know, Comcast and CenturyLink. And they view the world in completely different ways. One of them sees getting involved with community-based organizations as a marketing tool. 
and the other views the the library as obliged to tell their patrons about these programs. And you know, so it's it's good to know. It's good to meet with them and talk to them and find out what their what their viewpoints are and hopefully, you know, build relationships that can change them. And then there's other policy in terms of funding resources. Yeah. So um, we helped to get passed into law a community technology opportunity program here in Washington State. And locally, we take some of our cable franchise money and put it into a technology matching fund grant program. Um, sometimes fines and fees on, on telecommunications companies have gone to support digital inclusion efforts, mergers. Mm -hmm. so what agency did you um, sort of sponsor your state council? What state agency? Um, so we um, we actually formed it. We formed a coalition called the Communities Connect Network here in Washington. Um, so we is the City of Seattle, the Gates Foundation, University of Washington, uh, Washington State Eight. University, uh, Empower at the time. The, the ag. Um, the uh, extension, um, agricultural extension. Yeah, I actually brought, we, you know, we did this um, sort of um, uh, digital inclusion framework just using access, literacy, and content as a thing, and I, I brought some copies of this, although the, um, the email address at the bottom is, um, actually maybe this is still good, um, but on the, on the, oh, not on the back, I thought it was on the back of them, it was a little bit more about that coalition, but I'll just hand this around for folks. Um, so that, um, and a couple nonprofits, like community-based, like the YMCA have been really participating, so we formed that connect network to start to work on policy and, and exchanging information, collecting tools and curriculum and policies, um, uh, which are up on our Communities Connect web network website. Um, and then um, uh, through that, then we formed this Council on Digital Inclusion. We, we in a sense, kind of brought in the state, um, what's now the state broadband office. Um, so they are um, a really solid partner in the Council on Digital Inclusion. But you got started without them. Yes. We got started without them. That's a very important yep. point. Yep. Yeah. And they now view that. In our broad, our awesome. state broadband office is part of the State Office of Economic Development. It didn't used to be. It used to be part of the state IT infrastructure. Um, but um, they perceive our Council on Digital Inclusion to be the state Council on Digital Inclusion. And we brought in some other state departments that have been participating in that also. So sh should we mention the importance of having philanthropy mm. involved, right? Because Chicago had a similar situation where they had, um, which foundation did they have? MacArthur. So, um, MacArthur yeah. involved. And it lends a lot of credence. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not putting any cash on the table, mm -hmm. they're, just in the, they're just part of the coalition saying this is important. Right. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's enough. Just yeah. Just to have them, you're not asking for cash, you just want them as part of yeah. that. Blandman Foundation has been part of it in Minneapolis. Exactly, um, yes, we've all So the community foundations are a really good ally. Yeah, the community foundations are important stakeholders. Um, some are. Some are. Some don't get it. Yeah, I mean, that is our issue. We do yes. not have a state office on broadband. I mean, Blandon's been good in greater Minnesota, you know, in the rural parts of the state, but other. Um, Community foundations don't get the issue at all. I mean, that really is yeah. our challenge, it feels like, in Minnesota. Generally speaking, we have not gotten um, over the hump of enough institutions and people thinking that this is an important issue. Yeah. So one of the things that we did um, also for the Communities Connect Network is, so we gathered some data on you know, this is where, where the Public Computing Center directory was helpful in starting to survey. Um, to be able to um, pull out and say, okay, we know there are at least, you know, um, 500 centers in the state, or um, there's, you know, 100 places in the city that are doing this, and they're providing this hours of service. They, these are centers for workforce training um, homework help, um, family support. Um, and so then we did, we prepared from that presentations where we took some of the data we had 
and also pulling in some national data, um, you know, like from the Pew Center and the, the FCC thing, and packaging that with here's the uh, launch we did prior to the federal broadband plan, um, but here are some federal goals, uh, and then um, bringing in people who work at the centers on the front lines and doing uh, basically a presentation, um, which we have done for some other organizations, and we also did it for the state legislature, um, for committees, um, edu as education forums for them. So I think um, that's one opportunity. I think yeah. you're right, that important we, thing is people don't get it. They don't. We, our grassroots network is incredibly strong. And, you know, kind of where are all the community technology centers? We've got that, we've got curriculum and uh, you know available and we've we work together and it's it we just haven't been able to elevate it mm -hmm. you know minneapolis um has that's about the only place and that's that's what feels like we're just bumping up against mm -hmm. it's just hard to figure out how to make any entree and we're still trying i mean you know it's just a skirt. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe that is, um, so one thing is focusing on a specific area. I mean, that, but we go back and forth about that. Should we be focusing on the sort of workforce development sector, you know, or the health, or health and social services? And we know there's need in all of those, there's activity in all of those. Um, but for instance, at the state legislature, we decided to focus on the economic development committees because we saw that. It was partly an analysis to say, where is their the um, greatest sort of potential allies from elected officials? Um, where is there the sort of potentially lowest hanging fruit in terms of some funding support or other kinds of, of, of support? Um, what initiatives are they already doing that links to this? Um, we also, um, you know, finding in some cases, um, it's it's finding kind of the contacts that know how to operate either around the foundation environment or around the legislative environment or the mayor's office or whomever to help, in a sense, kind of get them this part of your team. And that's been really helpful for us from a, from a kind of lobbying advocacy, education, really education, right, um, point of view. <laughs> um, and. Uh, so over the, and inviting them to centers mm -hmm. too. Um, so, so looking at places where you can have events to celebrate successes and, and inviting key folks to come visit as part of that, having them speak as part of that. To, and that's been another place is providing them, key folks, the opportunity to speak about digital inclusion. As I think about that conference of mayors, well, for me, I'm thinking, okay, great. We've now reinforced the mayor's commitment to <laughs> digital inclusion because he spoke of this. He facilitated it. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's a really important part of that, that building the network. But, it, but it is, it's very challenging yeah, it's to find the problem. right person to you know, figure out what legitimates uh, digital inclusion in their mind and relates it to the things that they're doing. And it's relationship building um, process that they can be very challenging. And don't you have to figure out what their hot buttons yeah. are? I know Absolutely. when I get back in town, I got an email from uh, from my boss yesterday who said, newly seated council member wants to talk to you about your job center. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's for her. I'm going to focus right. on that. If it was somebody else, it might be economic right. development. Right. It exactly. might be yeah. education. Absolutely. And that's the importance when I was talking about the environmental scan and finding out your community priorities. I mean, that's that's where you use that information is building those relationships. You want to know if the mayor's hot on jobs and you go and talk about <coughs> digital inclusion, you contextualize it as jobs. And, and it's also um, putting forth that you guys are the experts. And so I think that's one thing that we've really been able to do over time really help them understand that we, we're bringing a resource to them to help frame their policies and platforms. And so some of those meetings, you know, some of that's helping um, you guys and the community providers think of themselves as, re you know, recognizing that you guys are experts in this field. Um, so that's been, been part of it. Um, 
sometimes it's actually been, in a couple of cases, been meetings with candidates prior to them being elected also. It's a little changing subject a little bit, but it's really back to the, um, if you can ever get to the survey point, which I'm not sure we ever will, but Paul is doing it. And, and, and one thing that um, strikes me sometimes about surveys is that in some ways, they almost contribute to what I feel like is this really terrible problem about public understanding, which you started with, mm -hmm. which is that the digital divide's all gone. Mm -hmm. And so that a, a survey that isn't able to ask very many questions sometimes contributes to the conclusion that it's all gone. Mm -hmm. So I was a little discouraged by the Minneapolis survey. I was envious because they can do it and they have people in their city government that pay attention, so that's great. But I was, I was worried that, that, that sometimes the conclusions are so general. Oh, you know, all these people you know, have access. And it feels like we're not really getting at what the real state of kind of this digital inclusion is. Now you guys, I'm sure, have a, uh, I just feel like that's something that if we ever get to the point where we can do a survey, I would really like to get some help on the kinds of questions that are better than others. For example, I don't know that I'd ever want to ask, do you have a computer in your home? I mean, that's useless. It's so useless. And it makes people think that we don't have a problem. That's right. Um, so, but, but asking questions more about, sort of, that are more about adoption, more about actual use of this whole phenomenon, which I guess is we all see in our libraries. You know, kids pour in. You, have, you say, do you have a computer at home? They say, yeah. Right. Well, they have four kids. Yeah. Right. They're all so, doing homework. And that is the important yeah. piece to understand. The the they, may have internet, they may have a computer, but, no internet, but they right. either don't have the internet or it's low it's speed. Low. And they come to the library because we have high speed. Right. I think focus groups and community meetings are really effective, low cost ways to get information mm -hmm. to present. Um, you know, again, focusing on those barriers to s challenges in service delivery, which is a big piece of what we brought to the legislators too, and um, barriers to, to mm -hmm. use and, and interest. Mm -hmm. We did a oh, mention, oh, we did a webinar with America Speaks, which was actually part of this grant, and they talked about um, convening groups and especially getting the hard to reach to come to these mm -hmm. sort of community conversations, which, um, so they have, a whole set of strategies for connecting with uh, community gatekeepers and getting to the people that you want to bring to the table who wouldn't necessarily come up with The recording is on to adoption. Yes. And who probably aren't, re aren't responding to the surveys either. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or they're not responding with all the information that you're really yeah. wanting to get. Right. And I'm happy to share our methodology around yeah. our indicators. Okay. Yeah, great. So David actually actually did a webinar and all of the resources he's mentioned are around the webinar page. So we can right. Yes. Yes. Lunch is ready and all these kids.